Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth event for our 2023 public speaker series, Looking Back, Moving Forward. I would like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners on the land on which I am this evening, the Ngunnawal people. It is upon their ancestral lands that the Australian Academy of Science is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices, may we also pay respect to, to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I would also like to extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today and watching online. My name is Vanessa Sewell and I am one of the conveners for this series along with Professor Tom Karma and Dr Jordan Pitt. Thank you all for joining us here in the Shine Dome and those joining us online. Tonight, we are all about country. We will hear from our speakers about land management and caring for country and how traditional knowledge are playing a vital role in our understanding of these areas. As we explore the sources of Indigenous knowledges together, it is important that any benefit derived from them is not simply extracted but created in partnership and for the support of those communities. Before we get started, if you would like to join in the conversation on Twitter, do so by using the hashtag Indigenous Knowledges. Questions from the online audience can be submitted by scanning the QR code on the screen. Questions from those in the Shine Dome can be asked at the microphone during the Q&A session at the end. So now, let's hear from our first speaker, Ms. Shandell Cummings. Ms. Shandell Cummings is a Menang Yoga from the south coast of Western Australia near Albany. She is a First Nations artist with varied experience in natural resource management, family violence casework, and youth work. Shandell has completed her Bachelor of Arts degree, majoring in anthropology and sociology and Indigenous knowledge, heritage, and history. She lectures and tutors in these subjects at the University of Western Australia in Albany, and Chantel, Chantel is currently pursuing the exciting opportunity to undertake her PhD. Please welcome Chantel. Thank you, Vanessa. Okay, let's start. Um, Guava Kadiak. Uh, in my language, good evening. Um, I would firstly like to acknowledge the land on which we share, uh, Ngambri, belonging to the Ngambri Ngunnawal peoples. I acknowledge their lived history and continued connection to land, sea and their culture and their peoples. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders and emerging leaders past and present. I would also like to thank the Australia Academy of Science for inviting me to be a part of this event. Bao Ngan Jerping Karing Karik Ngamborn Young Karajan. In my language, I am happy to be here sharing knowledge. Okay. Uh, my name is Shandell Cummings. Um, I am a Miraninga Yoga, so Menang, uh, for us, we say Miraninga, um, and literally that translates to um, those who eat mean. Um, so my country is along the south coast of Western Australia. Um, I extend from Warren River just past Denmark in the west all the way through to Israelite Bay in the east. We classify ourselves as shell people for the south coast region of WA. That's my matri or my patrilineal connection to country. Um, and on my matrilineal side, I have connection to Uwood country, which is just north of Perth, um, uh, through my uh, grandmother's family. Um, uh, my country is uh, along the south coast. Again, classify ourselves as shell people, but our boundary for, Tullyurak, uh, for, in, for going inland is actually Tullyurak, which is the Silver Mallee. Um, I have worked with UWA for a number of years, um, but prior to that I worked for an organisation when I first moved out to a farming property um, just east of Albany, about 70 kilometres out of Albany. Um, we worked to a farming property and my husband got super annoyed with me because I kept getting small grants to 
plant trees on farming property and he was getting annoyed and he said, go get a job. Um, so I actually got a job with the local um, natural resource management agency called South Coast NRM or formerly was called Script back in the day. And I came on as an Aboriginal women's support officer um, and we were asked to do uh, cultural projects across the whole South Coast region from Albany to Esperance or Denmark to Esperance. Um, I was based in that organisation for nearly 10 years um, and did several roles uh, while I was there. Uh, a cultural project officer right through to a cultural NRM facilitator role where we managed a cultural connections work crew um, and we delivered on ground projects throughout the whole region. Um, so obviously my, back, my um, background is in uh, a bit of farming, um, running sheep and some cattle, um, but also uh, natural resource management um, as well. Uh, I also run my own cultural consultancy, so we do deliver lots of cultural education with um, cultural awareness and cultural safety being a key part of that. Um, I also lecture and run tutorials at um, the Albany UWA campus as well, um, and I've just been appointed as a research officer, uh, research associate at UWA um, to undertake my PhD for the next few years. Caring for country is an inherent need or desire for Aboriginal people. Why, you may ask. As a young girl, I have been taught that my ancestors had beliefs, traditions and structures that have survived for more than 70,000 years. To easily understand what those are, non-Aboriginal people must work hard to develop relationships with Aboriginal people to learn about our obligations and responsibilities and what they mean now and for future generations. To demonstrate this, I will give you a personal example. Many years ago, my mum, Lynette, uh, was invited to represent our families in native title processes for the south coast of WA. However, this made her a little uncomfortable. So she went back to her father and she said, before I do this, I need you to tell me what country means to you. He said, well, it's like this, my girl. When my mummy found me, all the Yorgas had a yardie. They took all the things from when mummy found me and they buried it back into the soil. They can take that dirt, they can dig it up and they can overturn it. They can move that dirt from one location to another but they'll never remove our DNA from that soil. He said, that's my DNA connection to country. That's your DNA connection to country. It's your kids and your grandkids' DNA connect connection to country. This information made her comfortable to move forward with the process. Today, when we deliver cultural education, which we do quite a lot of it, where we come from, she teaches people with her favourite saying, we are a vital cog in the ecological system of Australia. So if my mum and many others across Australia or many elders across Australia have a similar belief, then it makes sense that we feel strongly about country and that we are integral to conservation efforts across our landscapes. Okay. Now, to give a little background to some of our processes. Approximately five years or so ago, my mum started working with Professor Steve Hopper and Dr. Alison Lulfitz on a project called Collecting the West. Mum saw this project as vital for her to leave a legacy for her children and her grandchildren. This project looked at recording family history, including language, plants and uses, landscapes, family campsites, etc. A key part of this project also included what we call intergenerational knowledge transfers across Miraninga Budja, while Steve and Ali also recorded the information. The plan is for this information to then be collated into a book that's there forever. So if we're not part of the process that she currently undertakes, then 
we've got something that reminds us who we are and where we come from. This process is led by non-Aboriginal scientists with strong inclusion of traditional ecological knowledge processes. The map you see on the screen today is mirroring our Budja. That's my country, that's where I come from. It extends all the way from just past Albany all the way through to Israelite Bay. These projects are key for us to actually undertake uh, traditional ecological knowledge processes, so TEK processes. So up in the top left-hand corner, you have a photo of Mum with Steve Hopper and one of the PhD students um, recording the, the discussion that they're having about that particular location. On the right, you will see Mum telling me about the significance of that particular location. On the lower left is my mum instructing my brother on fire burning processes, which are key for Aboriginal families and the way they travelled through country. Down the bottom, we have many other photos that also demonstrate the significance of the um, activities we do while recording this knowledge. In particular, the one on the right um, is my youngest child um, being taught all about lizard traps. So here are some key photos of us out on country. The great thing about this particular project is that it actually reinforces what we call reconnecting. Um, for Aboriginal people, everything is interconnected and to have one thing without another is virtually impossible for us. For our obligations and responsibilities, it helps us to reconnect to country it helps us to reconnect to traditions and practices and helping us reiterate our belief systems within our younger generation. It also helps us to connect to each other. Today's world, we sort of grow apart quite easily. And for our complex kinship structures, it's really significant to have events like this so that we can actually reconnect to each other. It also helps us reconnect to language. Mirroring our language is actually identified as a bit of a lost language. Um, and we're uh, pursuing efforts now to make sure that um, that information is shared with uh, the wider community. Um, but the most important thing and the most significant thing is that it helps us reconnect to culture as well. Now, as mum gets older, um, a lot of the things uh, are harder for her to attend. So me being next in line means that um, I participate in a lot of the processes that mum can't get access to or can't travel to. So on the left, your left, you'll see a photo of me um, working with some university students, sharing, them, sharing with them the song lines about that particular landscape, teaching them about cultural artefacts um, and cultural reasoning um, about particular locations is very significant. The middle image is a photo of us participating um, at the TEDx Kinjaraling in 2020, I think, um, or 21. Um, and then the one on the right is a project um, that Mum works closely with Noongar Budja Language Centre in Perth, who also works closely with CSIRO. Um, and they're looking at uh, the Atlas project, um, recording names um, of plants um, and animals and their particular uses. Um, Talurak, I've mentioned before, is like a boundary for us. Um, and it's also the indicator for us of where the ancient seabed goes to. So we know that when we're inside Talurak, we're inside the ancient seabed, um, and that's our home, we can speak for country. Once we're beyond Talurak, we have no right and we can't speak for country. Um, okay. So since this has started, there has been a bit of shift in the way things are delivered sometimes. So in 2021, Alison Lowell Fitz, on top of these events, um, also presented online at the ESA conference. And from that, we won the Bush Heritage Right Way Science Award. 
Um, Alison and I had several conversations about the best way to utilise that award. Um, and we utilised the prize to develop a couple of projects that focused on TEK processes, not led by non-Aboriginal scientists, led by us as um, uh, key people to deliver the program. So I coordinated and developed a couple of projects um, to undertake TEK processes, and we invited non-Indigenous scientists to also attend. So some of these photos are about returning to country and learning information, um, such as the local ochre pits um, and collecting ochre for our artworks um, that we've recently done in an exhibition. One of the projects we delivered um, out at one of the a friend's or Ali's property out at Boxwood, um, and the key component of that project was looking at broom making and doll making. So in that particular photo, um, you'll see me with mum and my daughter. So there's three generations um, in that photo, uh, learning how to make brooms uh, from local broom bush um, and also making dolls as well. So that was a weekend camp. Um, and we also delivered the process with uh, the younger generations. So um, that photo that's just flashed up is of my grandchildren. So technically there were four generations at that um, women's bush camp. We walked through quite a lot of bush um, and we worked closely with um, uh, some of the UWA uh, crew um, who we invited to attend as well. Um, and most of those were the girls, so some of the awesome PhD students that also work very closely with mum and myself, um, and Alison Lulfitz and her husband. Um, this is their particular property that we uh, camped on, which is, um, has high conservation um, ideals. That particular photo, um, we are looking for orchid, orchids and their bulbs. Um, so once the orchids are out, we mark them with a stick. And then when we go back after the um, stems and leaves have died off, we know that where we can dig, uh, dig up to do the bulbs. Um, so we'll be going back in a few months to have a look at those. Another project that I also coordinated and delivered, uh, we did a project with the Noongar Buja Language Centre and CSRI, um, which was a language project based at Cape Arid, so on Wadjuri country. Um, we also uh, tacked on a few extra days from that particular project, um, and we looked at um, some key significant sites um, for that particular location, so old campgrounds for our family. Um, and then we took our younger generation to teach them as well about locations such as Mundaburana, where the trees are still in the ocean. Um, a great way to um, share our information. So although we won the Right Way Science Award um, in the 2021 ESA conference. So last year I presented at uh, the ESA conference again um, on the women's bush camps that we delivered um, and talked about the positive outcomes that were achieved through those processes. TEK is very significant um, for us as a family. Otherwise, our younger generations don't get to learn about particular plants or animals um, that are very significant for the way we live our lives. Um, this particular slide we also utilised in the TEDx talk, um, and it was based on five plant species um, that we explored uh, a little bit better. Um, but these, this information is key for us to teach um, our younger generation. Um, I think it's really key to 
notice that even though we have processes where we talk about Western science perspectives um, and embed cultural knowledge into that, it's vital that we also have um, process and place where we can actually um, lead the way as well and invite scientists to join us. I think it's really key that if we don't uh, move forward together, um, there is potential that this loss or this knowledge um, could be lost within our own culture, let alone be knowledge that should be actually underpinning co conservation efforts now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Shandell. It was amazing to hear about the work you do. It's really interesting to hear about the traditional practices which you are used, which you're using to care for our country, and how important it is to implement these traditional knowledge moving forward. It's particularly important to make sure that we share this knowledge with the younger generation. Uh, we'll have opportunity at the end to ask Shandell questions, because I'm sure there will be a lot of them. Um, but first, tonight, let's get to our second speaker, Dr. Fiona Walsh. Fiona is an ethno-ecologist who works for, the, for Aboriginal people and organisations in cross-cultural contexts. She is an independent consultant and broad, with broad experience in desert Australia where she lives. She is also a photographer and a filmmaker. Previously a CSIRO research scientist for 12 years and land management coordinator at Central Land Council for 10 years, Fiona does both research and practice in land care and management. To hear more, please welcome Fiona. <clears throat> okay. Um, hello, everyone. Nice to see some friendly faces in the audience, people I know. Um, it's a big honour to be asked here from the Academy of Science, and I really appreciate that. And I was saying earlier, it's great to bring people from regional Australia into Canberra. It often feels like a really long way away, and like you're remote to us. <laughs> um, okay, and thanks to Tom and Lisa and Vanessa for, for the invitations here and other organisers. Um, so I'm talking to, or well, colleagues and I, this is a collective talk, I'm the only one here, but it feels very much a team effort, where an example where Aboriginal people's knowledge has led science and in the context of a really big international, and intense international debate. Uh, the debate itself is focused on Spinifex ecosystems, where I've been working for 35 years, but it's really opened my eyes to how little we know about these systems and how much more there is to understand about them. And the premise for this lecture series um, from, from Lisa is caring for country. And for me, the connection is that unless you know the country, it's actually impossible to care for it in, in a comprehensive and sophisticated way and care for those people who live on it and know it themselves. Um, uh, just in terms of Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, if there's people listening in the audience, thank you. And I don't know this country, but it looks rich and beautiful. And being here has made me wonder what did the old people use to prepare their foods? Because we'll learn a bit about food preparation through this talk. Uh, this is a, a, a sort of symbolic presentation of how we weave multiple strands of knowledge from Aboriginal people's knowledge and science and art. Um, and the elements, the disciplines of botany and anthropology and zoology and entomology. So there's many threads within each of those, those strands that weave together. And I'll also touch on the political and the economic context that two-way knowledge sits within, um, particularly in Central Australia. Uh, you'll hear from Aboriginal colleagues in two of the videos. It's a bit of a storied approach that I'm getting and part of a story is tension and conflict and debates and there's been plenty of that um, within this. But we're also driven a lot by curiosity and a certain indignation about 
other people's interpretations of systems that, where we live. So it's not a linear story that I'll tell. And the reality is much lumpier and, than that. Uh, these, how grateful am I to have such amazing colleagues? These are some of my colleagues, some of whom I've known, Gladys I've known for 35 years uh, in, the, in the top left. Um, and then there are younger and newer colleagues that span uh, Māru country, Warpuri country, the Uni of WA and Australian Wildlife Conservancy. So a big shout out to them. Uh, there's very little salaried money that's gone on into this work. Most of it is volunteer work with some in-kind, a $20,000 um, award from the Academy in 20, the Australian Academy of Science in 2020 is critical. Um, I'll, we'll hear from some of these next. In the previous slide was Carol. And here we actually are on the ground with Carol's grandmother in 20, 1986. Just a short clip. Particularly look at the surface that Winter's working on. That's what's important to this longer story. She's threshing seed against that surface. And off on the far right, there's a young, enthusiastic person with a botany zoology yeah, ground, background, it's me, uh, who wants to learn about plants and animals. Um, and it's in this context that after a botany zoology degree that I grew up on country, got grown up and taught about country with Madhu and have maintained, been fortunate to maintain those relationships, oops, over a long time. Oh, how do I get through this? Sorry. And that's a... Thank you. Um, leap forward from 1986 to 2005 to 15, and I'm now a CSO researcher in Alice Springs, as Vanessa said, continuing to work with Aboriginal people on bush foods and climate change and weeds perspectives. So really trying to understand Aboriginal people's views on matters that affect them as well as other Australians. Uh, working with some of the brightest and best arid zone ecologists in Australia, um, some of who couldn't be here because they're overseas, Mark Stafford-Smith, Steve Morton, uh, Mark Friedel, you might know some of those names. But in 1986, CSIRO has its, effectively it's closed in, sorry, 2017 CSIRO is effectively closed and an office with a 60-year history is made, is also closed. We're made redundant or relocated. Does this matter? Well, as I unfold this story, you might see some of the consequences of what could happen if, with, con with decisions like that. So funds were removed from public goods, social and environmental work to go to commercial and um, industry work. That same year that I was being made redundant, some of you might have heard there was a big international debate that went into the media about so-called fairy circles in outback Australia. And this, the media crisscrossed my desk. I read the article and I thought, hmm, that sounds different to what I heard from Madhu about what the cause of those bare spots are in the desert. Um, that media flared up again earlier this year, you might have heard. And I think it's on the strength of that that, that we were invited here. In shorthand, the argument goes something like, what are the red circles in these spinifex grasslands that get called fairy circles? This is a debate that's been transposed from Namibia and Angola to Australia. There's a German-Israeli Australian team who are arguing that the plants arrange themselves to collect water and nutrients from the bare area, that it's plants only that cause the spatial patterning, and that the circles are not related to termites. Whereas I'd learnt, as I share with you from Māru people, and is known by other desert um, entomologists, one of whom's in the audience, that the bare circles are the surface of a subterranean termitaria, and the world is underground and occasionally comes out to the surface, or regularly comes out to the surface to feed um, or, or fly to reproduce. So these red circles are the homes of termitaria. And this is, they live within, this is the distribution of spinifex grasslands across Australia. 
This is a big story because it spans perhaps 20% of the continent. Um, and have anyone, has anyone here, if anyone here has driven across spinifex grasslands, you know what they look like. Um, so in my work, uh, after CSIR closed in 2016, I worked individually as a consultant. And I'd sort of piggyback investigations into what's going on here with the termites and what are Aboriginal people saying about them nowadays with other projects because we didn't have any dedicated funding. And also uh, collaborated with colleagues in WA and, and elsewhere, the Australia, AWC staff in, at New Haven Sanctuary. In 2016, we put forward a paper. It was rejected by the, the international team and we'll come to that later. But a segue, and here's where we move between stories. 2017, I happened to be in Canberra. Is anyone here from the National Museum or Gallery, Art Gallery? In the NMA, I came across this amazing painting um, by Karpa Jumpy Jimpa, and it's called Watanuma. And I knew from Madhu that Watanuma was the word for the flying reproductive stage of the termites. Um, I'll come back to that painting, but it led me down the rabbit warren, I fell down Alice's hole, into the Aboriginal art world um, of understanding more deeply what is encoded in these artworks. With the Academy of Science fund, funds, we were, I then had some money in a break in a COVID, little COVID window opened up and I dashed from Alice Springs across the border into WA, which is actually not a dash because you get to go go via Perth, uh, it's a really long way, um, and worked with Madhu colleagues, but also colleagues who drove up from Perth. And we this time investigated on exactly the same sites that the German, Israeli, Australian team had investigated. Um, and then last year, we worked into the water story of what's going on with these round bare areas. So they're photos from both New Haven and uh, just near Newman in Western Australia. What did we find? Okay, so we, we found, this is one trench in concrete hard material. I've got some examples of the material here, which you're welcome to come and look at later. Um, and we found below the surface, the chambers and the holes and the galleries that indicate occupation by termites. Um, and we surveyed across four locations, 24 pavements and 60 trenches and found 100% evidence of termite structures and 40% of, of termites. The obvious question is, how did the others miss them? And there's methodological issues, there's issues of approach, there's issues of funding that sit behind this. So our home team, the Australian Madhu Aboriginal team and scientists, and the other, so we've published two papers. One came out in March in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. The others are on their seventh paper, probably writing an eighth as we speak. So, so two different theories are running parallel, but with really different explanations. We are confident we've got the correct interpretation. But if you were looking at football scores, you'd think we were wrong. Um, and now, in some ways, it's a really interesting debate. No, it's not. It's actually genuinely really frustrating and taking a lot of time. Um, and I'll come more to that later. But the fabulous consequence of this big international debate is that I've come to understand the landscapes that I live orders of magnitude more, but particularly I feel like we've as ecologists and as people who are working with Aboriginal people in the desert areas, miss things. We've missed the importance of these lingi, these fairy circles or red spots to people. We've revealed more about their cultural roles, how dominant termites are at scale in these grasslands and what their roles are. Uh, there's some linguists in the audience um, so we did a, thanks to the generosity of some of those linguists who provided their rich archives of dictionaries and um, other sources, 
we've been able to troll, scroll through them and pull out termite-related content, which starts to both show the spatial spread of Aboriginal knowledge around this, and it is a continental scale spread, um, as well as what some of the details are. Click. Oh, why is it not clicking? There we go. Um, just a bit about the spinifex ecology. So the termites live on, these termites eat grass, dead spinifex, not your houses, not timber, not fence posts. They live underground. They have a soldier and a work, they have different castes, soldiers, workers, queens, but they have this reproductive caste, which is the flying ones, which be, is a really important part of the Aboriginal story. Aboriginal Mardu and Walpri and other people have a fine taxonomy for those different castes, but they're also recognising different species, particularly with the... So ecologists will focus on the mouth parts. Aboriginal people will look at the forms of the flying termites to, to refine their taxonomy. In terms of the uses and why these are important to people, we saw at the beginning that Winter and Thelma were using the hard surface to thresh seed on, to process seed bulk at scale to feed their kids. So really important, like your kitchen bench. If you took the kitchen bench out of your house, what are you gonna work on? It's a really integral part of, of life to prepare food. The termites, the wing termites themselves were a major food source for people. Um, they, I've, there's an old man, Kiriwiri, who talked about collecting them by the bucket full. And someone just recently said he was wading through them up to his knees. So sometimes there's these major flurries of the edible termites. And then the other part of the story is that the round bare area catches and holds rainwater. It's concrete hard with a, like a kid's paddling pool and it holds 80 litres of water lasted for about two hours in dry soils under mild summer conditions. So significant waters. Here, Alice and Lee are having a conversation about them. Me and Alice were sleeping at uh, inside, inside that ranger. And the rain was still falling, falling, falling. Mm -hmm. And I was still asleep. Alice just got up, and she opened the door, and there she looked. And she started crying. I've been crying with the What do you know, my aunt, Pama Paro, we call up. Hey, Alice, why are you crying for? No, I'm you know. crying for my brother. <laughs> my brother's dreaming. You are? What we call him Wadunuma, Pama Butterfly. First time I've been gym. You are? Everywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. My brother's chocolate. Not full day, not Rain every day. Yeah. Pama Paro come out from water. Notice oh, the spots in the, the distance. Water. That's when the them. Good job. Ground. Make a little, little bit sharper and I come out from Grand yeah. Dog. From Mingiranga. Mingiri? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mingiri. The brown one. From a paroka, parami, Wayanga, and Mingirilla. A little bit orange and yeah. black. From a bird dreaming. Dreaming, I said, Chukurba, Chukurba. Chukur. That's brother. Chambajinba. My father. Wadonuma, Chukurba. Trade, Suri, from Suri. All right, um, we'll roll on to the next bit. So, so Alice is describing her strong feelings at the memory of Lee's father, her skin brother with this efflorescence. And it's just an indicator of, I mean, that was very unsolicited. It just happened when I was sitting at Nirpu last year. Um, but it indicates the strong sort of connections that people feel for animals that are largely maligned within a, a Western and white fellow world and largely ignored. Um, there's been no termite research in Central Australia since the early 2000s when Melinda Hillary did her PhD. 
um, on them, and none explicitly on this species. There was a Syro man, John Watson, who did great work in the 60s and 70s, but there's been this enormous hiatus. And now we've got different uh, aerial ways of observing country and drones. And this shows you from helicopter and drones just how many of these are. I mean, when I've seen this, I've been very surprised. I mean, the pilots who are in the audience may well have seen them and, and known them from desert areas, but um, at scale, because when you're driving along a road, particularly if it's a formed road, you just don't see these spots. This is a privilege that comes with either awareness of them, is a privilege that comes with either foot walking through country or the aerial view. These are absolutely the ecosystem engineers of 20% of our continent or so. And it really just hasn't, there's no, we haven't even been able to describe some this at scale. Um, so it's not just, I don't feel like it is just an Australian story, a, Aboriginal story, I feel like it's an Australian story as well, which is why, I come back to why. We come back to this carpet painting, so very fortunately, um, the Venerable Dick Kimber, who's an art historian, recorded documentation for it in 1977. And, and Carpa is drawing the pavements and the double bars are the winged termites coming out of the pavements and paths between pavements. Uh, he's drawing a place called Wadunyuma, which is near Nyirpi. But he's also gave us clues, like we wondered, you know, is this indicating water standing on the pavements like in that, that rain image? So we're able to look much more deeply into Aboriginal art and understand it, but learn from it in this sort of two-way process. Um, I mentioned that women, so this is Mung, um, another painting called Watanuma, but a different Watanuma that's near Kiwikora on the WANT border. Not only do women, did women thresh sea directly on the surface, but they actually dug pits into it, like Nunnages done there, and used a balance pole and foot threshed, like there might be hoofed animals working in Southeast Asia to thresh seeds. And I'm pretty confident that is some, what some of the iconography in this Wingia painting is, once we've got the two side by side. I particularly, I'm wearing something not just because I like it. Um, but this is Mongolpa, the seed. So this is printed by a Kunji artist from Haas Bluff of that plant which is on the right, which is uh, Kalaru, uh, or Mongolpa in Pindabi or Walpuri. Um, and it, it's got a really heavy seed coat that had to be worked and worked and worked and worked against a hard surface to release the seed from the husk. So I think partly why this has been less visible is that it was not, it's not the real, it's, it's women's work. So maybe it's just had less attention. But then when we look at scale, these are all artworks, both old from the early 70s through to, I could have put one up that was sent to me this morning that was painted last Sunday. Um, by really well-known people, but you start to see the similarities between the artworks and the, the ground and aerial images. Um, I'm in there, Kapa and Winji, we've seen this is one of Winji's early ones of the same seed. This is Michael Nelson, Jakamara, who's in the forecourt of Parliament House here. Um, important works. Uh, and the artists and the photographers. Um, again, I've roped in friends to put up their drone or fly a helicopter, or been very lucky to have one great helicopter pilot be really interested. Why I feel strongly about this story and want to share it with you is that I'm worried that we're looking, I want you to know about this spot pattern before it disappears, because climate change is sort of pervasive everywhere including with the wildfire regimes that are ra ravaging Central Australia and have done in 2012, 70% of the Northern Territory arid regions burned. And we just don't know what do the termites eat. 
when we've got wildfire regimes that are bigger than the small hectare scales that Aboriginal people were burning in the past. So it might be, tragically, that what I'm showing you is a disappearing pattern. And I think it's as important to include in state of the environment reporting and climate reporting and carbon accounting as, as what's going on in other of our big significant ecosystems in arid Australia. Um, okay, so to sum up, so it's a pattern that's known to Aboriginal people, invisible to others, but you're here sharing and learning about it, that's great. The Spinifex country is not rubbish country. I still get pastoralists say to me, oh, that's rubbish country, or it doesn't get identified in agriculture land unit classifications, and the termites don't get any mention. Um, it was Aboriginal burning practices that maintained part of the integrity of these termite systems, and I think that they're actually human-shaped systems, as um, Chantelle said, Chantel said that have co-evolved with Aboriginal people for at least, we think these spots might be Holocene or early Pleistocene, late Pleistocene age. We think they're really, really old and there's been a co-evolution with local people. In our case, we've put Aboriginal knowledge in front of science, um, partly because I'm cautious about letting the science dominate. And if we can find this out about one taxa, Imagine what sophisticated knowledge there is in artworks and dictionaries and other sources for other species that are significant in Australia. And I guess what I've learnt is how to more systematically both work with contemporary people but bring in those, those old sources. Where do we go from here? Um, it's a blank slide because I don't know. Um, ideally, we would have a process of returning what we've found. So we've got it in a top science journal. That's fine. But what's important to me is sharing it back to Walpuri and Madu and other Aboriginal peoples on whose country this is. But I've sort of hit a wall on, on funding and partnerships that um, span this. So I'm really open. Any ideas, links, connections? Um, and then there's some really big science questions. What's the antiquity of these? What's the formation? What would conclusively settle this science debate? And there's also many big cultural questions. Can we unpack more from the Aboriginal artworks? Um, what I keep hearing fragments of stories from Aboriginal colleagues. How do we hold and share that content so it's available for their kids and for their grandkids to know their country? That's it. Thank you from me. Thank you, Fiona. It was really amazing to hear about your work. I think it's really important to highlight the fact that Aboriginal people have lived on this country for at least 60,000 years, and they lived sustainable lives. It is clear that their knowledge and the interconnectedness of it can greatly benefit the future of our country. I just want to mention as well as an Indigenous woman or an Indigenous person that we come from the land and the land owns, owns us. Now, I would like to invite questions from the audience to both of our speakers, if Shandell would come up. Um, you can submit your questions by scanning the QR code on your screen for those who are online. Um, or you can come up to the microphones, which are walking around. Is there any questions online? There are. Uh, Vanessa, um, hello, my name's Paul Richards. I'm just reading out some of the questions that have been sent in. I've got one for Shandell and one for Fiona so far. So Shandell, I'll start with you. There's actually three as uh, a sort of combined in one, lots of interest in some of the images that you were sharing in your presentation. Uh, and this um, person asks, please tell me more about the lizard traps and what do you do with the orchid bulbs and what are the five plants that you showed at the end used for? Okay. If you can wrap that up in one. <laughs> That's impossible. Um, but. Wait, now which one was first? Lizard traps. Okay, tell, lizard, just tell us something lizard traps more about are a structure uh, which we find on granite outcrops uh, most of the time. Um, and according to um, 
traditional practices. Uh, there would be a certain time of the year and a certain time of the day uh, where you would be able to source lizards. So if you're walk, walking on granite outcrops, they would run straight onto the lizard traps, thinking that they're protected and you can't see them. But usually their tails are sticking out, so you could just walk along and pull them out. And uh, So a food source, an easy food source for Aboriginal people back in the day, definitely. And the others were just about some of the plants that you were showing. There was a question about what do you do with the orchid bulbs? So and orchid tell us a bulbs. bit more about the yep. um, So other orchid plants. bulbs are another food source as well. So um, depending on which ones were um, prevalent at any time of the season. So um, probably why there's not a lot left anymore, but won't, we won't go there. Um, they are actually a food source. So part of our traditional ecological knowledge processes is actually seeing and doing. So um, teaching our younger children, like this is what we would have done back in the day. Um, it's not a practice that we undertake all the time, um, more of that cultural education uh, within our younger generations. Um, the five plants at the end. So the first one was chiak. So we're very, we're totemic people. Um, so for my family, uh, we have two totems. So chiak is our plant totem um, and our uh, animal totem is, uh, we call her Yiridi. She tells us stories or tells us who's coming um, and who's passed away. Um, so a bit of a sad, Bird, but uh, the Western Jirigni, as most people would know her, yeah. Um, so that's Chiak. Uh, the next plant was Talra, which is a silver mallee, so that's our boundary. Um, it tells us where we can and can't speak for country. Um, so Talra, I can't remember, oh, Muja was the Nitsia Floribunda, yep, so that's our Christmas tree, native Christmas tree. Um, so it's a spirit holder for us, so very significant spiritual plant. Um, don't know what the next one was. Oh, Oka Warrior. Um, so that's in a space, Fitzgerald River National Park, um, which is a, a space that's quite sacred for Aboriginal people. So it has storylines connected to it. Um, and the carts there, so the hills, so carts are our head. Uh, we we'll call hills cart as well. Um, they have a story connected to them. Uh, at Fitzgerald River National Park, so we're not allowed to walk on carts. They're very significant, yeah. And I don't know what the last one was. I think you've done oh, very well. the cyclops. So the um, acacia cyclops. Um, so when we see that, we know that would have been an old campground. Um, so Aboriginal women would have carried those seeds. They would have ground them up. Um, so throughout river systems, um, or extending back from them. Um, they're quite prolific. They will just, you know, fire will just set them off and they'll grow everywhere. Um, but they would have ground those seeds up and put them into fish. So like a flower, um, good value nutrition for children. We've just found the image you might not be able to easily see, but for <laughs> the plants you were describing, yeah. thank you. So I got them, I got them all right. <laughs> Was there any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, I had two questions for Fiona. I was wondering if you think maybe the um, fairy circles were compacted by the termites digging their houses, I don't know what you call it, under the, under the soil, and maybe that's why there's no plants living on top? Sorry, yes, um, you're right, yep, so they're uh, you're correct. Yeah, they're bare and hard because they're really consolidated surfaces that the termites have reworked and turned into something as hard as concrete. A crowbar bounces off it. So, yes, sorry, I should have said that, which is what makes them such a good working surface for threshing the seeds with the hard rock or a stick. Um, and my second question was, that information was obviously shared with you quite freely and you were able to share it with the world. What might you have done if you saw these papers that were coming out that you considered misinformation because it conflicted with what you heard from uh, the local Indigenous people, uh, but it was sensitive information or, or information that they didn't feel comfortable sharing? Uh, good question. 
Uh, look, I mean, sensitive information, I would be very careful, for one, and I would go back to the generations now and explain sensitivities that have been told to me before and then ask what people, I'd ask, um, what people want to do with them in, in response. And things, sensitivities shift and change. They're not fixed. They're really, I'm surprised how much, how dynamic they are. Some things open, some things close. Uh, it's, it's a very fluid world. Thank you. I'd ask. I think we've got another question over here. Hi, a um, million questions, uh, but I'll just ask one or two. Um, uh, Shandell, you mentioned trees still in the ocean. What was that about? <laughs> um, so down in Esperance, the ranger program there have discovered forest in the ocean. Um, Mundaborin up, it's called, so it's out at Cape Arid. Um, there's a story, like, different families have different stories connected to that location. So uh, for us, there is a particular story of why there are trees in the ocean. But when we talk about Tullyark, that's like our ancient seabed. So we know the ocean was a lot further inland as well um, before it went out, but there's a reason why it came. Um, so yeah, it's down in Esperance. So there's still remnants of the tree stumps uh, in the ocean that when the tide goes out, you can actually still see them. Fantastic. Um, and that kind of leads to my next question, which is how how is traditional ecological knowledge changing in its interaction with science? How are they in your um, experiences? Or, or the other way, I mean, yeah, how are they interacting and... How are they growing together? Yeah, I think one of the photos that I had was scientists leading the way. Um, bit of a pun, but I mean, we've always been spoken to instead of spoken with. And I think there's been this big shift over the last 10 years or so, a little bit more than that, um, where people really embed themselves in our lives and create those relationships, which is significant for us. We need that to occur, um, especially with our TEK processes. So um, people who, who do that, um, it's more of that side-by-side -side working. Um, but I think we'll see another shift as well, hopefully in the future, where Aboriginal people are taking lead, like they're, they're doing their business on country and inviting scientists to come join them. Yeah. Got more, but I'll wait. <laughs> Is there any other questions from the audience? Thank you. I'm interested, Fiona, if um, the last talk I was here several weeks ago was about wildfire hmm. change in the Northern Territory, where the fires were just so damaging in the, in the savannah really in the Spinifex area, but the Savannah area. And a program that, that really got underway with significant results back from 2006 was showing an enormous reduction in the damage and the smoke that came from it, the smoke pollution that came from it. That, and I wonder if, if something similar is happening in your Spinifex areas to reduce the damage of fire. Yes, so that, I mean, Dean and Russell, who's, who's, um, Jeremy, sorry, who spoke to that, um, that's happening through, as you saw, with Aboriginal ranger groups, um, multiple Aboriginal ranger groups across the top end, and certainly across the Spinifex grasslands, there's many Aboriginal ranger groups, um, and cultural, so-called cultural burning on country and aerial incendiary burning is certainly a part of each of their, their programs. But even with um, those activities, the accidental emissions, the lightning emissions, are still contributing to really major fires. Um, at, I mean, the 2012 fires that uh, Grant Allen sort of monitored have been repeated. Um, and, and it's, I mean, even the area that we've been looking at at Newman, uh, which is only 20 kilometres long, 
that's incrementally being sort of e eaten into with multiple burns. So it's a really it's a really serious issue. There's just not. I mean, one of the things is there's just not enough people on the ground able to do the small and with the skills and the knowledge to do that regular small burning, which was a part of like in pre-colonial times was part of everyday practice. Um, it's scaling that up is really challenged by particularly isolation of people living in communities, being remote, having vehicle access, lots of limits to it. Um, yeah. I think we've got another question down here. <laughs> I'd be used to that. Um, what you prove is that those air patches are made by termites. How can your opposition claim otherwise? What, what is going on there? Can I send you there? So there's a matters arising letter that they've sent to Nature, which I sent off our reply yesterday morning. Um, look, I, it's, it's a big question. I don't know, Matt. I mean, I'm not probably, I could speculate over a cup of tea with you. Um, but I think it's a really serious, and it's part of what I'm saying is that, I mean, their, their theory, if it wasn't for our determination, and Aboriginal partnerships, their theory would be dominant in describing that, that area internationally. And it would get cited and repeated and come to be the norm. I mean, they've gone through peer review processes. They're publishing in really high-end journals. It somehow feels like it's a flaw in a science process as well as um, that, yeah, other, other factors. It's very peculiar and complex, yeah. Are, are Aboriginal people aware of this controversy? <laughs> yeah, they are, of course they are, because I've been working with them and they, they had actually heard, because they read the news too, and Desmond Taylor, um, you know, said to me, oh, but what about the aliens, which is why I put up the, so he uh, he somehow read, what was that in Washington Post? You know, Desmond knew about other theories for this. And in their very generous way, he said, you know, the way to fix this is ask them here. We'll show them. Um, it's as simple as that in some ways. Um, so we sort of wrote that in a more, <laughs> in a different way at the end of our reply on this, you know, this to and fro debate through nature. I I think that's all we have time. We've got one more question. <laughs> yeah. um, this relates to uh, Aboriginal communities that have become entrenched in urban situations. Uh, what level of interest in traditional knowledge of country do they have? And do they engage with you rather very easily? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, for me, I don't live in the desert, but. Um, I think people are very open to processes and knowledge. Um, for example, mirroring our language, you know, it's, it's pretty much a, a rare or lost language. So we've um, done several through the uni and one of the PhD students there. Um, we've run courses on mirroring our language um, and we've had a couple of those. and. You know, people are very open to that. Uh, cultural education, um, artwork, so exhibitions, etc. People are always open and want to come and learn more. So uh, we try and run as many events as we can in the community. Um, sometimes it's hard to do that when there's very limited funding. Um, but yeah, I think people are very open to knowledge or cultural knowledge and learning about that and having it complement what they currently do as well. So, yeah. Okay, that's all we have time for this evening, unfortunately. Um, and thank you for your amazing questions. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Shandell and Fiona for joining us tonight and sharing us with us their work that they're doing. Um,
Yes. <laughs> I also want to th say thank you to my co-conveners, Tom and Jordan, who can't be here tonight. Um, it is great to work with you on this series. And also thank you to Edge Catering for the refreshments earlier. Uh, finally, I want to say thank you to you guys, to the audience. Um, we hope to see you again for the next instalment of Looking Back, Moving Forward, which will be on the 10th of October. Uh, the topic is going to be the skies and stars. Uh, and more information will be available soon. So thank you and good night. <laughs>